Good afternoon. Hope everybody is doing well today. Today I wanted to do something a little different. I really wanted to provide a video that demonstrated what it's what it looks like um, when you apply critical race theory to American art. Um, now some of you may be like, what the hell is critical race theory? Um, <laughs> critical race theory is an analytical framework, right, that pretty much assumes that racism is embedded, you know, in the American fabric. Um, and so when I apply critical race theory to American art, most of the time when I'm approaching like traditional artworks or what we come to think of as traditional American artworks, I'm always looking for the brown and black people first. Um, you know, I always say you don't have to look, you know, super hard, right, to find us um, in narratives of early American colonial history. So what follows is the results of applying that framework to a painting in Pathos Collection by Benjamin West entitled Penn's Treaty with the Indians. Um, and the cool thing about it was that as much as that painting um, represents the history of William Penn, um, particularly his familial history because it was commissioned by his son, um, through a lot of secondary research and some primary research, um, I discovered that through a different type of interpretation, um, the painting could also represent the histories of not one, but two of the most prominent African-American families in colonial Philadelphia. Um, so again, if you feel so inclined, like the video below, tell your friends to follow Black Art in America. You can follow me on Instagram at LA616. I hope you enjoy and I will talk to you in a few days. In the fall of 2016, just a few months into my tenure as the Low Curatorial Fellow at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, I was confronted by a group of students who wanted to know why there were not more paintings depicting people of color in the museum galleries and why there weren't more paintings by people of color in the museum galleries. And my original response, I said, what do you mean? There's a Henry Tanner, there's two portraits by Joshua Johnson, there's a landscape by Edward Bannister. And just the looks on their faces, one, they had no idea who these artists were, and two, that they were even African-American. And the paintings that I was referencing of white sitters and by white artists that told the stories or were connected to Native American histories and African-American histories, the students had no way to access that information. As it is oftentimes deep in the object file or buried within the archive itself, students of color, general audiences of color can have a hard time finding people who look like them um, that are connected to objects that don't quote unquote represent them. So I figured I had to do a little bit of excavating and I decided to start with Benjamin West's painting, Penn's Treaty with the Indians. Benjamin West was an acclaimed American history painter and portraitist. He was, of course, a son of Philadelphia, born in the Springfield area, which is now Swarthmore, Pennsylvania. And he trained in Rome and in 1763 traveled to London, never to return to the American colonies. He was appointed the official history painter to King George III and was a founder of the Royal Academy of Arts. He was later elected its second president and West was also named an honorary academician at PAFA as well as a PAFA board member. Commissioned by Thomas Penn, the son of Pennsylvania's founder, William Penn, Penn's Treaty with the Indians is an allegorical painting depicting the legendary meeting between William Penn and the members of the Lenape tribe at Shackamaxon on the Delaware River in 1638. This treaty led to the establishment of Penn's Woods and ultimately the city of Philadelphia. So knowing that the painting stood as a visual marker of William Penn, his descendants, and his overall significance to the city of Philadelphia, I asked myself what would happen if we looked at the Lenape figures in the painting? Who were some of their descendants? And could those individuals have had just as an important significance to the development of Philadelphia as William Penn? And on this occasion, the archive didn't let me down. I discovered Cremona Mori through an examination of the family histories of two of the most prominent African-American families in colonial Philadelphia, the Bastilles and the Montiers. Prior to her marriage, Cremona's full name was Cremona Satterthwaite. 
She was of Native American heritage as her father was a member of the Delaware Nation. As a child, she was enslaved by Humphrey Morey, a Quaker who later condemned slavery, but was the first mayor of Philadelphia appointed by William Penn himself under the first city charter. In 1715, Humphrey Morey manumitted those he enslaved and Cremona became a house servant for the Morey family. During her time as such, she began a relationship with Morey's youngest son, Richard, which ultimately led to a common law marriage between the two. Upon Richard's death in 1753, she inherited 198 acres of land, which is now known as the Sheltonham area. Cremona and Richard had five children, but it was primarily their daughters, Elizabeth and Cremona Jr. that I was most interested in. One, because Elizabeth married Cyrus Bastille, one of the most important African-American businessmen and anti-slavery leaders in colonial Philadelphia. Their union produced eight children and their youngest daughter, Grace, married Robert Douglas. Their two children, Robert Douglas Jr. and Sarah Maps Douglas, were some of the earliest African-American fine artists in Philadelphia. Robert Douglas Jr. was a very well-established painter in Philadelphia throughout the 1830s and 40s. He was a premier portraitist and one of the first African-Americans exhibited by Paffa in 1834. However, when he showed up to Paffa Taxi, view the work in the galleries, he was turned away because he was black. This portrait is a rendering of the prominent abolitionist and very wealthy businessman James Fortin, who was the grandfather of the esteemed antebellum poet and anti-slavery activist Charlotte Fortin Grimke. Sarah Maps Douglas, who was Robert Douglas Jr.'s sister, um, was a primary educator um, throughout Philadelphia. But she is important to the story because she offers our first look at watercolors produced by an African-American woman. Um, her works can be found in the Amy Matilda Casey Friendship Album at the Philadelphia Library Company. This then led me back to Cremona and Richard's youngest daughter, Cremona Jr., who married John Montier in the portraits of their youngest son Hiram and his wife Elizabeth that now hang on view at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. So I think that was one of the really cool things about doing this research and particularly doing this research with the students that semester is that it took a painting that's typically, you know, interpreted to represent, you know, Benjamin West or um, William Penn or, you know, and even the Lenape Indians, um, but not in the same depths. Um, took that painting and, you know, opened it up and opened the students up to a whole world of African Americans um, connected to that moment in history, right? So even though they're not, they're, they are not like directly connected, you know, to the painting itself, right? They're directly connected to that, that historical moment and the figures that grew out of that moment, a period of history um, of African American history or American history that they didn't really know a whole lot about, you know. So thinking about Cyrus Bastille, right, as a millionaire, and um, James Fortin, you know, as a millionaire, um, thinking about, you know, people like Charlotte Fortin Grimke and Sarah Maps Douglas, and so again, like in and even Cremona um, Satterwhite and Elizabeth and Cremona Mori, just the importance of black women, right? How black women were navigating the colonial period um, and, and were doing so as leaders, right? As, as absolute leaders. Um, you know, the other cool thing about it is it really opened them up to other scholarship, right? So scholarship by Gwendolyn Du Bois Shaw and Erica Armstrong Dunbar and, you know, Donald Scott, um, the Hortons, Benjamin Quarles, you know, just people who have written about, even my advisor, you know, Manisha Sinha, um, people who have written about, you know, Blacks in the colonial period, particularly in Philadelphia, um, you know, for years now. And this is scholarship, right, that they wouldn't have come across, right, in a, just a typical art history class um, or a typical class on, you know, colonial and American art history. Um, and so I think it really lent itself to the benefit, you know, of utilizing a critical race lens or critical race approach when discussing traditional American art objects. 
For more information, check out the links below. BIA is a document used to preserve and promote the contributions of the African American art community, so this content is made free of charge. But if you would like to support our efforts, please visit buyblackart.com. Live with the art you love.